welcome back to Bridge to Wellness. My name is Bridget Gila, your host. Today's very special guest is Lloyd Arbach, MS, is world-recognized paranormal expert with thousands of media appearances and the author or co-author of nine paranormal books, the most recent being the revised Psychic Dreaming and republication of Mind Over Matter in 2017 and ESP Wars, East and West in 2016, covering the psychic spying program of the U.S. and Soviet Union Russia. He is the founder and director of the Office of Paranormal Investigations since 1989 and the president since 2013 of Forever Family Foundation, an organization supporting research on life after death and the work of spirit medium in the grieving process. He is on the faculty of Atlantic University, JFK University, the Rhine Education Center, and HCH Institute, teaching parapsychology and other subjects, both online and locally in the Bay Area. Arabak's media appearances on TV, radio, and in print, including ESPN's Sports Center, ABC's The View, Oprah, Larry King Live, and Coast to Coast AM, and late night David Letterman. He is a parapsychologist, professional, mentalist, psychic entertainer, performing as a professor as paranormal, an author, a professional speaker, and a professional chocolatier. So back in the beginning, um, as where did you come from? Were you born here in the Bay Area? No, actually I'm from the New York area. Mm. I mm -hmm. lived uh, in Westchester County through my, until about graduate school years, but I grew up in the New York area. My dad worked for NBC at the time, so I spent a lot of time at 30 Rock in New York City, uh, in and around television. And uh, my interest in this subject actually came out of probably watching too much television as a little kid. I had a, had a TV set in my room when I was two. Oh. And like, it was cheap at the RCA family store. And mm -hmm. uh, also was an early reader, but mainly reading comic books and science fiction from the mm -hmm. start. So, I started out very early on watching television programs like The Twilight Zone and reruns mm. of One Step Beyond and Topper and other shows. And that just kind of got me interested along with my interest in science. Uh, I was very interested in astronomy. My dad actually worked for NBC News on some of the space shots, the early space shots. So I had a real interest in space and science in general. And luckily, I discovered that there was a science around psychic phenomena when I was probably about 12 or 13 thanks to a TV show called Dark Shadows, which sent me to the library and uh, okay. got me finding those books that were by people who were kind of my predecessors in the field. Oh, interesting. And speaking of um, astronomy, and uh, do you know anything about the blood moon? I know a little bit about, you know, the, the relationship has to do quite a bit with the Earth's shadow kind mm -hmm. of falling on it, but without actually being an eclipse, a full eclipse. In some parts of the world, yeah. Okay, it was such a big thing yesterday. Yeah. And a lot of people doing ceremonies and rituals. Yeah, lunar rituals go back, you know, anthropologically you can find them going back thousands of years. Of course, solar rituals too in different cultures. Uh, the moon and the sun were the two things that were probably worshipped more than anything else uh, in early days. I'd like to go into uh, what you're teaching now as a parapsychologist. Mm -hmm. When in college, I actually focused initially on astronomy, astrophysics, and then switched over to anthropology, cultural anthropology. And I was very fortunate time-wise to, first of all, have an advisor in the astronomy department, excuse me, well, in the astronomy department at Northwestern was J. Allen Hynek, who was the UFO expert, mm. who actually knew a lot about parapsychology, and that's part of why I went there. But in the anthropology department, I ended up with an advisor who knew, also knew about parapsychology. So it seemed like I was in the right place at the right time each time. Mm -hmm. And then there was a new program at JFK University, which is here in the, in the Bay Area, uh, that had just started up. It was a graduate master's program in parapsychology. Uh, and I, time-wise, got in on the ground floor pretty much about a year and a half after it had started. So I have a master's in parapsychology. Uh, went back to New York and started teaching parapsychology, first for adult ed, and then for one, one community college, mm -hmm. um, working at the American Society for Psychical Research, which was the nation's oldest organization, research organization. Uh, and that gave me more of a background, which brought me back out here to JFK to teach in that graduate program and also 
be the media liaison for quite some time throughout the entire Ghostbuster period yes. in the 1980s. Uh, unfortunately, the program ended uh, partly because of in university politics, but mainly because of funding. Mm -hmm. So we no longer have that program anymore. And I really don't teach parapsychology at JFK anymore, haven't for years, but I teach parapsychology mainly through the Rhine Research Center, which is the nation's oldest research lab, originally started at Duke University. And we have a whole program of courses that are online for people to take. And the course that you took was mm -hmm. through HCH Institute in yeah. Lafayette, uh, where I'm teaching, I'll be teaching occasional courses this, this particular year. Um, we're, we're not an online course uh, provider, so it's really difficult for people in the Bay Area always to get to courses in Lafayette, given the traffic, as you know. Yes. So um, I'm taping a little bit there, and I'll be doing some of uh, my own video courses coming up. I'm just redoing a couple of courses for that, specifically one on developing your psychic abilities. Okay. Can you talk about that a little bit? Mm. Yeah, you know, I'm not a psychic. I don't pretend to be, well, I do pretend to be a psychic when I'm performing, because mm -hmm. I'm also, as you know, a mentalist and former magician. Yeah. And the thing is, thing is that parapsychology studies psychic abilities, psychic experiences of average people. We study psychic phenomena, such as apparitions and hauntings and poltergeists. And we have learned a lot about what makes certain people more psychic or less psychic. There are certain common factors that people have. And along with that, what we've learned from the laboratory research and working with psychics, there's also what the psychics have said about what helps them make themselves more psychic and how they learn or how they teach other people. It's very clear what we've seen over the decades in my field that there are common factors between all the courses that psychics typically teach, but they all have their own different methods because they're all coming from personal experience rather than looking from the outside at all the the spread mm -hmm. and also the laboratory findings. So my course, uh, and I've taught it actually online, and I've taught it in other ways, I'm gonna make a video course available relatively inexpensive uh, in the next few months. But the course is really looking at exercises you can do to learn to be more psychic and then helping yourself figure out actually where your psychic abilities or aptitude lies. You know, one of the biggest misconceptions I think the general public has is that a psychic can do everything. You know, people go to see psychics they want to know the future. Not every psychic does precognition. Not every psychic can tell the future. And the better psychics will tell you they can only predict what's likely to happen, which then you can change. There are psychics who work specifically with police. Some work actually in very different ways than others. Some want to know everything about the case so that they're providing only new information. Others feel like they can't know anything in order to get a, a full picture of the case. And that's indicative of psychic abilities. People mm -hmm. have different ways of doing it. Uh, some people are good at healing, but they can't do anything else psychically. Some people seem to be able to move things, but they can't do anything else psychically. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like artists and musicians. They have their particular specialty, and they might be able to dabble in other areas, but very few artists can paint in multiple disciplines, can sculpt and do other types of right. art. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. So um, I was going through this book, and I'm just going to open this book. I think it, this is the one, Ghost Hunting. Um, and uh, psycho, I'm very interested in psychokinesis. Can you, can you explain what that is? The psychokinesis, which most people would know as telekinesis mm -hmm. from TV and movies, mm -hmm. is the idea that our minds can affect matter and even energy directly. So, I mean, I'm, I'm moving my hand right now. That is kind of mind over matter. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about outside the body. So the ability to affect change in the physical environment around us, whether it's from the very quantum level, we do some testing with computers and other things using quantum particles, and, or the, the, what we call the macro level, which is the level you can see, which is everything from perhaps moving an object to even psychic healing, because you can sometimes see the change in healing as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really applications of that. And again, some people are good at certain things, but not others when it comes to psychokinesis. Right. Uh, the reason we don't use the word telekinesis is because that means movement by the mind. And yes, if I move something with my mind, that is telekinesis, but it's typically at a distance. That's a tele part of it. Uh, psychokinesis means movement by, literally movement by the mind. Mm -hmm. So okay. we use that term, PK. Okay, PK. And is that... Is that very similar to Qigong? 
Do they use those techniques? Yeah, you know, there's, it's very interesting. Um, one of the research labs, in fact, the Rhine Center is doing bioenergy research. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at photons of light given off by the brain through the skull. I mean, we actually give off little particles of light. So minimal, you'd never see anything there's, under any circumstances, even the best of circumstances. But they're doing work with Qigong masters, um, mm -hmm. with some martial artists, other martial artists, with healers, and a few other types of people who claim that they can manipulate energy. And what's really interesting is that some of these people, as they're focusing on their task in their minds, mm -hmm. when they're in this bioenergy lab, which is completely blacked out with a device that can detect even one photon per second, which is ridiculously low, uh, one healer, in fact, has increased his output to something close to a million photons per mm. second. Still not visible, but it's a huge change from one photon, which is typically what our brains might even give off. So psychokinesis has a ter is a term that kind of is an umbrella. And anybody who does energy work, whether it's Reiki, whether mm -hmm. they're doing Qigong, whether they are manipulating Qi in other ways, in other martial arts, it all falls under mind over matter. Right. And what about the heat that you feel outside the body when, when you're doing, for example, Reiki or Qigong? You know, the, the, the idea of feel what you're feeling, the perception of heat, uh, it's hard to know whether that is your physical body feeling it or a perception of the energy manipulation that comes through as heat. You know, this is one of the basic problems that we have typically with psychic information to begin with. You know, people have a vision. We always think about a vision of the future mm -hmm. as a, a, vi a video, something like that. And it's not being seen with your eyes, though. It's being seen with your mind's eye. So when people perceive things psychically, they will see, hear, smell, feel, pretty much everything but taste, it seems. Um, there's a perception of that because we don't have a psychic sense that we can pinpoint to. We're used to our normal uh, five sensory groups that we've got. So whether you're actually feeling real heat, whether there's measurable heat, because I've tried this with Reiki people, there is no measurable heat there. Um, or whether or it's just a perception of, is which what I think it, it actually is. You're still manipulating the energy or whatever is going on is being manipulated. We're not sure it's energy actually. We're, we're still not sure because it, it can't be detected mm -hmm. typically. So yeah. it may be something, either a form of energy that has yet be, to be discovered, which of course physicists would balk at. Uh, they balk at it because they don't think there is another one, but that doesn't mean there isn't. Or it could be something else entirely that is felt as energy. Which leaves me very curious. Mm -hmm. There's no conclusion, but it, it just keeps me on the edge to always research and always educate myself in these, in these fields. But how would you purify your eyes um, just to block out any illusion or delusions of, um, so that you can actually feel the energy through Reiki or Qigong? Well, I think uh, if you're talking about kind of removing other sensory input or yes. false sense perceptions. Right, right. You know, it's tough to remove false perceptions in the sense that um, all perception is false. I mean, it, we learn to perceive the world. We learn how things, we learn what the color blue is. We learn everything from infancy. Uh, we learn how things work. Yeah. And our eyes and everything else picks things up and our psychic senses, I mean, if you're talking about Reiki or Qigong for that matter, a perception of energy would, be, would fall under what we would call extrasensory perception. It's still a perception, which is something that is happening in your consciousness, but it's not being used with working with the normal senses. And so blocking it out You'd have to, uh, to block out your normal senses, you'd have to go into a sensory deprivation situation. And if you did complete sensory deprivation, you wouldn't be able to do anything because you wouldn't be touching another person or even seeing another person. Mm -hmm. So it'd be very difficult to do that, I think. Hmm. Hmm. That's so interesting. Well, always, it's, that's always the case of, of constantly educating ourselves and, and just feeling our way through life. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of mystery here. Um, that's one of the things that attracted me, is that mm -hmm. it's an area, the thing that really gets me about this field and all of science in general is, in the United States especially, there's an academic prejudice, a scientific prejudice against psychic phenomena in general. And that prejudice has increased over the last probably 40 years, partly because of the activities of some of the skeptic organizations. 
uh, and certain people in science who are just adamantly disbelievers. They're not skeptics, they're actual disbelievers. Mm -hmm. And what happens is that you have millions of people around the world that have these experiences. You have practices like Reiki, which seem to have a positive impact. You have practices like Qigong, which have a positive impact. You have the placebo effect, which has very little study to it, and its opposite is the nocebo effect. There's very little study on it, because there's almost no funding on it. And yet it's the measure against which we go with, we, we look at the placebo effect against drugs. How much better does that drug do than placebo? But we don't know how the placebo effect works. That's mind over matter, mm -hmm. actually. It's mind body. So for science itself, in general, to ignore these things, just because they don't think these things can exist, goes back to people like, well, it's like the Catholic Church saying that the, the world was still the center of the universe and really chastising and, and causing problems for people like Galileo. And before him was Giordano Bruno, who was one of the first persons to think that actually the earth was not the center of the universe and he was burned at the stake. So we have a problem, we have a prejudice against unknowns. Um, I just picked up a, a book yesterday, I haven't actually read it yet, um, called We Have No Idea, which is a wonderful, looks like a wonderful book about all the things we don't know about physics in the universe. Mm -hmm. So it's a pretty thick book about things we don't know. And it's okay if it's within a field not to know something, but apparently with human beings, you just have to make assumptions that we already know everything. Right. What about clearing your mind as far as um, your, have you heard of chakras? Sure. Yeah, yeah, clearing the chakras and um, and the pineal gland, the pituitary gland. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, the chakra is a it's a particular system of thought, a philosophy about the body. Um, the Chinese have a different one about the way the body works, with, which is where acupuncture works on it. Different cultures have different views of the flows of energy through mm -hmm. the body. Uh, we don't really deal with that kind of thing in parapsychology per se. But the pineal gland actually is kind of important in some respects, uh, or perhaps in many respects. Uh, you know, it regulates certain aspects of our circadian rhythm, our daily mm. bodily rhythm. It regulates other things. And if you go back to the 1960s, science thought that it was something like the appendix. It had no function whatsoever. And yet it turns out that you probably wouldn't stay sane or healthy if your, your pineal gland was not working. So we have to learn other things about ourselves. The pineal gland is apparently subject to influence by the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, there's a woman in England named Serena Roney Dougal who has been doing research on the Earth's magnetic field and its effects on the pineal gland, specifically in relation to psychic experience. Uh, there's been some other research by the late Michael Persinger and Stan Krippner and a few others in the 80s especially looking at the relationship between highs and lows and how the Earth's magnetic field shifts on a local level to psychic experiences and our laboratory results and such. And there have been correlations found. And Serena Roney Dougal's research looks at the pineal gland specifically to this and seems to indicate that that's involved in all of this process as well. So the ancients thought that was the third eye, and they may very well have been right third eye was the mm -hmm. seat of our psychic vision. Mm -hmm. Like the Wi-Fi. Kind of like Wi-Fi, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, the, mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, it's where perhaps our psychic information goes through that, perhaps. We're not mm -hmm. even sure if that's the case. Um, but if it's, since we mostly think about psychic information, ESP, as being visual for most of us, that it would make sense that they'd come up with an eye for that. But it right. doesn't, it's, it's not an actual eye. Oh, interesting, interesting. We hear so much. There's, there's a lot of um, new age information out there that unfortunately, a lot of the metaphysical stuff has been pulled from various cultures and folklore over the years and has been put down as, as kind of canon. This is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And what we find is that people's actual experience doesn't work that way, typically. What do you mean? Well, as an example, um, I work with psychics and mediums. I've worked with a lot of mediums over the last few years, uh, spirit mediums. Um, I've worked with psychics over the years. I've been around psychics, and we had an organization here in Berkeley years ago called the California Society for Psychical Study. It doesn't mm -hmm. exist anymore, unfortunately. And we had a psychic speaking, a good psychic speaking, mm -hmm. and the psychic talked about having had been abused as a child. 
And that's how she believes that trauma made her psychic. And she then pronounced that most psychics she's met had some sort of childhood trauma like abuse. So her conclusion was that if you hadn't had a trauma in your life, especially a physical and emotional one, the odds are you could not possibly be psychic. In the meantime, the, the psychic I was working with at the time, Annette Martin, who was an amazing psychic, she passed away in 2011. She was actually the co-author of this book mm -hmm. with me. Um, Ghost detectives. Yeah, Annette did not have childhood trauma. She was not abused as a child. She grew up in a family that encouraged her to be psychic. You know, it was exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. And many, many psychics and mediums I know like that. Uh, so you have individuals from their experience will talk about what must be, or from their perceptions, and they will indicate what must be. And that is true coming from them. And there are other, others that, yes, they will attract others to them that have similar experience, mm -hmm. but you can't generalize to the entire population in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes with different cultural perspectives on psychic experience, just like there are different cultural perspectives and historical perspectives on the world, it being flat. And there, unfortunately, there's some people who still believe the world is flat or that the Earth, Earth is the center of the universe. There's any number of different interpretations of our perceptions. Uh, if you... Uh, take people in a different cultural context, like even out of their environment, they will see the world differently. Uh, there's an old story from uh, an anthropologist, um, I think it was Colin Turnbull, if I recall correctly, and I may not be right about this, this is some from my, my college days. Uh, and this was a, a, a story that he told about, he was studying the pygmies in Africa. He was working with that, that particular tribe. And they were um, in the rainforest, so they pretty much didn't see the sky that much. They, everything was green around them. He took some of them to the edge of the rainforest, and there was a vast plain that was there, and there were water buffalo off in the distance. Mm. They'd never seen a water buffalo before. They thought that there were bugs, a large, large, large group of bugs. And as it happens, the herd was coming towards the forest, and they were getting very excited because the bugs were getting bigger. Not that these were distant animals coming yeah. closer, because for them, distance was limited because of the trees and everything else. So their perspective on how the world worked was limited by their environmental experience and yeah. their personal experience with the world. And that's the same with people's psychic experience. Yeah, like a Coca-Cola came falling from the sky. Yes, <laughs> like the gods must be crazy, that's correct. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. that's a good one. Yeah. So, Moss Beach Distillery, mm -hmm. your experience. And first of all, before, um, before I talk about my experience, can you talk about how that started? And um, Sure. Yeah, yeah uh, so I, I've been out here in the Bay Area since 1983. I um, came out before that for grad school, went back mm -hmm. to New York, came back out. So I've been out here since 83. And uh, during the 80s, because of Ghostbusters, started doing a lot of television. Uh, we focused on a couple of locations. Uh, but I had not even heard, really heard about the Moss Beach Distillery because I didn't spend a lot of time looking for public locations. Now, unlike the TV shows that we see, the paranormal TV shows, our focus in parapsychology has always been working with, with individuals or, or families in their homes, people who need help. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily go to locations to work with a, a restaurant or a hotel unless they call us for something. Mm -hmm. Or unless there's a TV company that comes in and they say, uh, we need to go to, on a haunted, haunting investigation with you. Can you take us on one of your cases? Not far from the lonely beauty of Half Moon Bay in California is an old restaurant that's under renovation, and some say is haunted. Built in the 1920s, the Moss Beach Distillery was a speakeasy with a dangerous reputation. This is a haunted place. It's a place where people are experiencing someone who has decided to stick around and interact with people. For years, paranormal investigator Lloyd Auerbach has been searching for evidence of a haunting. People call this a, a recording. People call it house memory or place memory. It's the idea that the environment at the local level can hold information pretty much the way a videotape does. There's something going on in the environment that holds information. According to local legend, what went on at the distillery was an affair between the piano player and a woman in a blue dress. When her husband caught them together, the lady in blue was found on the beach, stabbed to death. Her husband disappeared. Today, people claim the lady's ghost appears in and around the restaurant. 
Server Patty McKellar was totaling receipts one night. Uh, all of a sudden, for no apparent reason, three of these uh, credit card books came flying out of the wall with a fair amount of force. And the two of us looked at each other and our hairs kind of stood up. Another witness, contractor Rick Barilick, believes the lady is even haunting the renovation. We had our plumber down there and he came up and told us to not to flush the toilets. Just as he said it, a pipe burst. Next thing you know, we hear him screaming, top of his lungs, who flushed the toilets? And like, there was nobody downstairs. We were all upstairs. We enlisted Half Moon Bay police officer Brian Thompson to help us compare investigation techniques. In a case of a murder trial or a murder case, we basically just block off the area, make sure that none of the evidence is tampered with, and then call in a, a detective's unit or a forensics expert to come and collect the evidence. The first police rule, don't disturb the scene. The evidence law enforcement takes is physical evidence, fingerprints, photos, witness statements, anything that's tangible. The investigation rules don't change for a haunting. Again, don't disturb, but do photograph anything in the scene that ghost witnesses describe. The other times that we've been here, where people have claimed to have seen the blue lady, we got some pretty intense magnetic spikes. Once you establish key areas of activity, like where the lady in blue is most frequently seen, then you can use a magnetometer to look for strong magnetic fields around your haunt. You can buy one in any electronics store. Document any unexplainable results that it produces. So if something's haunting you, remember, are there multiple witnesses? Is there other physical evidence? And if so, don't move it, but do photograph it and the area. Study magnetic fields surrounding the site, but check for other explanations, like electrical equipment that may be causing the phenomenon. If you do everything on the list, you just might have a ghost watching over you, but not necessarily as colorful as the lady in blue. She loved the place when she was alive. She loves the place now that she's dead. So she's apparently made her own choice to stick around there. Cases, and we cannot take TV to our private home cases because of confidentiality. Uh, it just disrupts too much. It's also, um, there are issues around that ethically, but also with possible fraud. Mm -hmm. So we stay away from those. We take, go to the, the other places. In um, 1991, I got a call from a Japanese television company. It was actually Tokyo Broadcasting Systems. And they wanted to start doing a series of specials for TBS focused around a medium in Japan named Aiko Gibo. And Mrs. Gibo was, uh, had, was working with police. She was a, a spirit medium. She had a, lot, a, a few other talents as well. And they wanted to go to, uh, to do two things. They wanted us to test her, her, her ability, one or more of her abilities, put her in a research situation. But they also wanted to take her to a haunted place. And for the first one, um, we decided to try something new. And I looked up in a couple of books what would be a good place. And I saw this place, the Moss Beach Distillery. They wanted someplace very scenic. And I had been to this restaurant. I didn't know it was haunted when I'd been to it. So I called the restaurant up, spoke to the owner to see whether we could bring the psychic in and do the TV thing for J Japanese television. Uh, so John Barber, who is still the owner of the, of the restaurant, uh, had just bought the place about a year before. He was a skeptic, he was self-admitted skeptic. He said, I don't disbelieve, I don't believe, my daughter, he said, my daughter even had an experience here when she was working as a waitress mm. uh, a few years ago, so before he even bought the place. And he said, I know the previous owners, then they had a bunch of experiences, and I don't know what to make of it, but stuff has been happening. So the first thing he did was he asked me, well, you know, before I let TV come in, do you think this is a good thing or a bad thing for television coverage of, of a restaurant being haunted? And my, my question to him was, how's your food? And since he said stellar, yeah. and the food actually is amazing <laughs> there, uh, then it's a good thing. Because mm -hmm. it really boils down to people going to a restaurant that's haunted. If they have a, a ghost experience, they might come back or they might get scared off. But if the food's good, and they didn't have a negative experience, they'll come back for mm -hmm. the food. Forget about the ghost. So we went in there with Mrs. Gibo, um, had a really interesting situation, uh, trying out some new equipment, mainly electromagnetic field and some other sensors that we, had, we were building, actually, with the help and money from the Japanese TV company. And Mrs. Gibo um, immediately started connecting with the Blue Lady, the ghost who's there. She was known as the Blue Lady since the 1930s. Actually, we found out in later years that she was known as the Blue Lady when she was alive. 
because she used to go frequent the restaurant wearing these bright blue dresses. Yeah. Was it a uniform? No, it was not a uniform. She just liked bright blue clothing, mm -hmm. as it happened at the time. So we're in there having a conversation um, with Mrs. Gibo talking about this. And Mrs. Gibo, um, first we interviewed a whole bunch of the, uh, the, wait, the wait staff and the owner and everybody else. So we got some really good sound bites from people about their experiences. And then after hours, Mrs. Gibo sat down at a table <clears throat> in the main dining room and had a conversation with the ghost. Invited her to place herself across the table with her. It was an interesting situation with us watching and filming. Mrs. Gibo spoke Japanese because it was for Japanese television, mm -hmm. even, and ghosts don't need language. It's all mental communication anyway. But the most bizarre thing to me at that point was Mrs. Gibo pulling out fashion magazines, flipping open to certain pages, and showing them to the ghost, who we could not see. And that came back later, a few months later, we, we found out why that was. But late, later that night, uh, because Mrs. Gibo had such a friendly conversation with her, she asked her if she would do something for the cameras. And we're in um, the second dining room, which was unfinished at the time. They're just building it. Rough floor, hadn't been painted yet. There was barely any furniture in there. It was just really stuff we dragged in. And there was a push bar on the back door. And Mrs. Gibo said, yeah, she's going to open the back door. Back door opens, mm -hmm. closes again. So I immediately put one of my people outside because I didn't trust the Japanese film crew at the time. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and asked Mrs. Gibo, Gibo to ask the ghost, please do it again F five more times, which the camera mm -hmm. caught. Um, there was no handle on the outside of the door at that time, just a lock. There was a push bar and you could see the bar go in and the door opening up. And that immediately made me feel like this is a great place. You know, it's a friendly place, the food's good, um, the ghost is friendly. So a couple months later, um, I was checking in on them. I wanted to continue to follow what experiences people had there. A couple months later, uh, the owner said to me, um, did you guys do something with the ghost? Did you invite another ghost here? I said, well, what are you talking about? And he said, well, people are reporting a woman in a short black cocktail dress and her hair is up differently. And I said, really? And I brought a psychic mm -hmm. down with me, and it turns mm -hmm. out that was the same ghost. Mrs. Gibo had given her fashion advice. No. And she learned to change, her, and taught, told her how to change her look. <laughs> That's so, and she's I'm almost never seen in a blue dress anymore. Mm -hmm. um, she's been seen in different clothing, but it's, it's always, people have seen her multiple times, it's the same woman, it's the same face. That's been happening over the years. So we've, we've been there many, many times. I've brought many different psychics there. We've got more and more detailed information about her. Her name was Elizabeth Clare, and we're not sure of her last name, but she asked to be called Donovan. Uh, that was her boyfriend's name, as the story goes mm -hmm. from the old timers. This was a woman who was, who was working next door at the hotel. She came over and started an affair with the, the piano player, mm -hmm. who turns out to be Charlie Donovan. And... Uh, that led to her, and her husband found her, because she, she had run away from her very uh, nasty husband mm. from, mm -hmm. I think, Indiana, as they're called, from the Midwest. Her husband found her, tracked her down, and we think the husband killed her. So we don't have any absolute verification of this, but she was seen shortly after her death uh, and continued on after that. And we did get the, word, the name Donovan, and we only probably about 10 years ago. So we got the name Donovan in 1999. And we had no way of knowing who some of the names of the people specifically or who had died or who had been around at that time, uh, other than some prominent people. And then uh, one of my friends who's a psychic who actually had been there and had conversations with the ghost found, was searching online doing some genealogy research, and she decided to do some stuff looking around the distillery. And mm -hmm. since more and more old newspapers are getting online and more and more obituaries are getting online because of genealogy research, she found a... Uh, and a obituary for Charlie Donovan's brother, mentioning Charlie <coughs> of the right age group to have been the right age at that time. Oh, interesting. So since we had yeah. gotten the name Charlie Donovan and all this other information, we've mm -hmm. we had little things verified. Um, I've had some information from the ghost from, by the way, she likes to be called Kate. That's, uh, she, she doesn't want to be associated with her previous name because she did, didn't want to be associated with her husband. So yeah. even though her name was Elizabeth Clare, she wanted to be called Kate. That was just a, a joking thing that happened mm -hmm. also in 1999. 
So Kate, um, through Annette Martin, actually provided us with kind of narration about three um, raids that had been done on the smuggler's beach below the restaurant. The restaurant was a speakeasy. It had never been raided, but the beach had been. Gave us some narrative on that. I'm thinking, well, how are we going to how are we going to prove this? This wasn't in the newspapers at all. We had no way of proving that it existed. Most of the old timers were gone. Mm -hmm. Turns out a few months later, I was interviewing somebody at the USS Hornet. Whose father was an attorney for the state of California on three raids at the Smuggler's Beach below the Moss Beach Distillery, when it was called Frank's Place. And basically verified through what he mm -hmm. recalled without me saying a word yep. that we had gotten this information. He actually talked about the exact same rates in the same way. Oh, so we've had yeah. a lot of really interesting connections with other cases, and it's kind of a fun case yeah. for us. Do you, would you call it an apparition? She's an apparition, yeah. Um, whether she wants to be released? We've had that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Annette and I used to go down to the distiller on a regular basis uh, to have conversations with her, and we would invite people. You know, unlike the typical seance on TV or movies, we were we had dinner, we sat around with the lights on, and Annette started having a conversation with her. People could ask questions, um, and we asked that question. That actually came up many times. And the response was always that she felt at home in this place. Uh, when, she, when she died, she didn't know if her husband did it or not, but she didn't want us to talk about it because she was stabbed in the back. She was found with a knife in her back. So we don't 100% know it was her husband. Mm. But she felt comfortable there. Um, she likes her existence right now. She knows she can move on, but she's perfectly happy to stick around. And since Annette has died, <clears throat> Annette was such a big part of her afterlife, you might say, that Annette has been seen with her as an apparition on occasion. And other mediums have communicated with the two of them together. Oh, that would be interesting to experience that. Yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a pretty interesting thing. Um, we do know that uh, Kate does not stay at the distillery all the time. She learned mm -hmm. a long time ago she could travel. You know, one of the misconceptions is that apparitions are stuck in locations. Mm -hmm. And the only time they're stuck is if they don't know they can go anywhere. Can I share yeah, please a share story? your experience, yeah. Okay. So I took the children to Moss Beach Distillery um, one day. It was probably the... I think it was the second time there. Mm -hmm. And the first time I, I didn't experience, nor did I even um, expect anything to happen. And um, I don't really see things, I don't look for anything. I just think, oh, that's, that's cool. It's, it's a nice story and fun. I was sitting having dinner and I had the children go to the restroom. And, and I thought it was fun because I wanted them to be scared. And I said, no, you go by yourself. I wanted them to look in the mirror and say, ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw something. And I was thinking, ha ha. I, was, I wanted them to be scared. <laughs> so as I was waiting, I felt fingers glide into my hair just like this behind me. And I thought somebody was maybe flirting with me, mm -hmm. or and, um, and, and I thought there was a table behind me. So never even thought for a single moment that it was an apparition, not at all. Because it was, I felt the fingers, it was felt like a human, mm -hmm. a real person. Right, right. So, um, so I just, um, I smiled a little bit and I thought, hmm, who is this? I turned around and there was no table behind me, no one behind me. There was no one, no human being mm -hmm. caressed my hair. It wasn't a wind, it was I felt it against my scalp and caressing my hair like this. And then, and then it was gone. So you are, are describing an experience I've heard from a number of people over the years. Really? That's yes. uh, sometimes the women who have that experience lose an earring. So hopefully you didn't lose an earring that night. I, I don't remember if I did. Yeah. <laughs> she sometimes snags things from people, just as a little extra afterthought. I'm going to think about that. Yeah. 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 You know, it's it's interesting. Um, she's always been friendly, playful. Um, she's always been very protective of the place. Uh, she's 
you know, it, it is her second home, you know, whatever her other home is. But she, she definitely senses people who have the sensibility to pick up on her as well, and she will play with them a little bit. Um, unlike most ghosts, most apparitions, she has over the years learned to do some physical things too. So she's occasionally moved the lamps for us, the door, as I mentioned before. Uh, th there's been some really interesting things that have happened. In fact, the, the, the first time I went back to the restaurant after <clears throat> that initial visit with the, the TV crew, um, I was sitting with a buddy of mine because we, we were talking to the owner about doing an event there. And with my friend Larry and his wife were sitting there, and they had been, they'd already, they were already there, so they got their drinks, and I had ordered a beer. And the waitress is coming with the beer, and I could see her walking up, and all of a sudden the beer <laughs> shot straight out of her hand, like about two feet, and then dropped and crashed on the ground. And it spilled, but the, the glass didn't break. And Larry just looked at me and said, oh, that was probably your beer. And the waitress comes over and says, sorry, I'll get you another beer. <laughs> so she was making herself known to me. And, yeah. and I've had some other experiences with her. I've, I've had her walk through me in one instance uh, multiple times, which was kind of a, a really interesting experience. What does that feel like? Well, um, we, were shoot, we were doing a two-night overnight uh, after that 1999 um, session that we had with Annette, communicating where we got the name Kate and all this other information. Mm -hmm. And I had investigators throughout the restaurant. We were doing some video shooting. We, were, we had also equipment there just trying to detect her presence, which, you know, frankly, the, the stuff you see on TV is the equipment. It doesn't detect ghosts. We're actually hoping to see if there's any change in the environment when she was around. So I, I did get an unusual reading on my EMF meter when I was behind the bar, um, prob probably an hour after closing. I was alone in the bar area, and the EMF reading was actually coming from the ice maker. So, uh, which I suspected, but as that happened, I all of a sudden felt like a weird push, almost, if you've ever been in the surf, and you feel the surf kind of hitting your body and you kind of mm -hmm. like pushes you for a bit, mm -hmm. that's what it felt like. And it felt like this wave that went through me, mm. and then it went from front to back, it did the same thing. So I, I immediately knew that something was going on with her. And I started timing it. I am a researcher after all, so I did start timing mm -hmm. it, and I could, in, not through my eyes. I, I've never seen a ghost. I've, I've felt things. I have smelled things. I have heard my name called by her, in fact. Um, but I've never seen a ghost. But in my mind's eye, it was very clearly a visualization, like a vision, you might say. I saw this young woman wearing a short black dress, giggling, and walking back and forth through me. And I could see clearly in my mind what jewelry she was wearing, what her hair looked like, the whole bit. So you do have a gift. With her, at least, I have a connection with her. I, I, I will say that over the years I've learned to be, because I, you know, I teach psychic development, and I've learned to open up in certain areas. Um, I tend not to do it completely because I'm still the researcher trying to assess things. But when I go on cases, I pick things up from time to time. I wonder what it'd be like if you had maybe a Reiki session before, before one of these, a Reiki session, Qigong, yeah, it might be interesting to that see that. That would yeah. be interesting. Yeah. 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 So you were saying? Yeah, so um, I timed this for about two and a half minutes, and then around the corner came three psychics that I was working with, including Annette. <clears throat> and one of them said, they all stopped and looked over at me and started laughing. And one of them said, she's walking three, isn't she? And the second one said, wait a minute. I think we scared her off because I felt it stop and it, it moved away. And the third one said, yeah, she's walking away. So I separate the three of them. I ask them to write down what they saw. What was she wearing? What did her jewelry look like? What did her hair, how, well, how was her hair arranged? And they all matched. And they only, mm -hmm. not only all matched each other, they matched what I kind of picked up myself. Mm -hmm. So um, Annette always used to say that uh, it's a good thing we came around the corner because things could have gotten out of hand if they left me alone with the ghost for a while. Yes. Yep. She was clearly being playful and she felt very yeah. comfortable with you too. Yeah, right. That yeah. you were showcasing her. I was showcasing her, but uh, you know, I've put so much attention in, felt so positive about the place over the years um, that some of the psychics have referred to as my ghost girlfriend. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. I was just kind of thinking yeah. about that too. She wanted full attention from, mm -hmm. the, from this other gentleman and you're giving her that sort of. In some sort way, of, yeah, yeah. your girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's it's an interesting situation, and uh, you know, I know actually, I have a since that time, 
before any psychic I work with, and if I'm walking into the restaurant, before they say anything, I know when she's around and when she's not. I have a very specific, and I can't put words to it, a very specific feeling inside when I know she's present. It's almost like she left her mark on me mm. in that way. And how it felt? Giggly. Uh -huh. Bubbly. That's how it felt. Yeah. That's her personality. Yeah. Well, she's, not really, she's not really attached to me any more than my friends are attached to me. You know, but if there are circumstances in our work where we run into situations where people seem to have a spirit that is attached, and what we see, and this also comes from various religious traditions too, and, and folklore and anthropology, is that it's almost the like attracts like. So we see situations occasionally where people who are, for example, drug users or alcoholics or neurotic, and there's a spirit that in life was alcoholic or a drug user or neurotic, and they find these other people and they just kind of follow along, almost like they're getting secondhand smoke. They're getting a hit, a hit off the smoke hmm. that you, the, your emotion is giving off. And what that does, unfortunately for people, is it seems to exacerbate their situation, whatever that issue is. Mm -hmm. So there is something that um, some hypnotherapists practice called spirit releasement therapy, mm -hmm. which is almost a form of hypnosis to turn the client into a medium temporarily to have that face-to-face, heart-to-heart, you gotta let go of me, you gotta move on yeah. situation, and it seems to work pretty well. And the thing I can say about this is that even if there's no ghost there, there's no apparition attached to you, no spirit attached, that therapy still works for that person. So, you know, we have, um, in hypnosis, there's spirit, there's a past life regression, mm -hmm. which we in parapsychology do not consider good evidence for reincarnation because you rarely ever get verifiable factual information. But it's incredibly powerful as a therapeutic tool. Past life therapy is amazingly uh, powerful for people. Yes. And it, that makes it a useful tool, whether you believe in past lives or not. So there are many tools that, yeah. they may really be what they say they are, but it works, so it doesn't really make, make much difference. Yeah. You have several books here. What is the one book that you would highly recommend um, for waking up the spirits? Well, you're talking about waking up other spirit ghosts? <laughs> or are you talking about waking up your spirit? In order to um, get in touch with the the other side, you wouldn't it, wouldn't it be important to waken up your spirit first? Well, you know... Awaken? Perhaps, but I think it's more important that you do one thing, which is to notice that you're already psychic. You know, the one thing that uh, I learned years ago, when I worked at the American Society for Psychical Research, there was a researcher named Carlos Osis who was doing out-of-body experience research. And he was also doing investigations. His main psychic subject was a guy named Alex Tanis. Uh, Dr. Alex Tanis was a, he actually taught parapsychology at Southern Maine, uh, University of Southern Maine. But he was a lifelong psychic. He could do out-of-body work. He could do a number of healing. He did a number of things. He worked with police. Actually, when I was working there at that location, we had NYPD and Boston PD and Philadelphia PD and the FBI showing up every time Alex was in town. <laughs> uh, he just never talked about it. So people mm -hmm. didn't know him. He was kind of the unsung hero. But Alex told me that the first step in becoming psychic is to know that you already are. Because we have constantly, we're scanning the environment psychically. We may have spirits of our loved ones trying to connect with us. We have to be open to those things. We have blocked ourselves, not through our own fault, by the way. Um, our society, our culture has taught us not to be psychic. Children are extremely open to this stuff. But then they're told, no, no, you're just imagining that. Mm -hmm. It's just an imaginary friend. You can't possibly know what Uncle Harry is thinking. We're taught that by our families. We're taught that by our education system. Our culture, you're told you're weird if you have any of those experiences. So, as Alex would say, the first step is to pay attention beyond your normal senses. Pay attention to your normal senses, yeah. and you'll start seeing things that are not part of your normal senses. And, th and then once you notice that, things start opening up. Right. So mm -hmm. I, I think that that's kind of your first step for that. Mm -hmm. Mediumship is a, a tough thing. Um, people can often get in touch with their own family and relatives. But the, the step to take to become a medium who can see or perceive other spirits, different. And a medium would separate actually um, a ghost like or an apparition like Kate at the distillery from the, the spirits they normally talk to. 
because there are people on what they call the other side who have passed on, who can project themselves back and communicate through mediums. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones like Kate who have not moved on yet. And some mediums are actually afraid of the ones who stuck here because they know that some of them are crazy, mm -hmm. just like any normal human being mm -hmm. might be crazy. Um, they don't want to deal with counseling. They don't have to deal with that with, with spirits on the, from the other side. So being open and being watchful of any sort of message that might come from family members, that's important. Right. And what about using things like sage? And what do you think about that? You know, you have to find what works for you. Um, the burning sage thing was adopted from a particular Native American tradition. It's cultural appropriation in some respects, or mm -hmm. misappropriation. Uh, you might as well just get um, a talisman from somebody in Chinatown or something else. It's whatever works for you. Mm -hmm. it, it's what you put into it. Um, I've had people call me and say they have problems in their homes. The home is, home is haunted. They've tried burning sage. Nothing works. They had a priest come over and throw holy water around. Well, A, they're not doing anything with the sage other than burning it and smelling it. So they don't know what they're doing there. And B, they're not even Catholic. They're lucky they got a priest to come over and throw holy water mm. around. It has nothing to do with anything. It has to do with intention. Mm. And if your intention is this, the sage will do something, it will do something. This is where that placebo effect comes in. <laughs> it really is a placebo effect. I mean, you're basically using something else to turn on something for, in you. For Okay, for, for the live person? For the, the live real person. person for or? the real person. Sa burning sage does nothing for apparitions and ghosts unless they believe that. <laughs> you know, there's an old joke about vampires. Uh, it was a Woody Allen joke, I think, originally, where, um, you know, an old guy in, in Eastern Europe, you know, a vampire bursts into his house and tries mm -hmm. to attack him. And um, the, the guy, guy actually holds up a cross, because that's what you see, right? Mm -hmm. And the vampire looks at him in a very thick Yiddish accent, says, listen, buddy, have you got the wrong vampire? <laughs> I'm Jewish. <laughs> so it's all about symbols that mm -hmm. relate to the person. And you can scare a ghost out of a house. We've done that. Yeah. You can make a place uncomfortable for a ghost, but it's only going to work if the ghost believes it, mm. if that's what you're talking about. Um, when we talk about hauntings, we're talking about places that have memory. So emotions left behind by people who may not have been the most pleasant people. That mm -hmm. house, we've all gone house hunting. And that we walk into a house and it just feels icky. And yep. then if you were to, to dig a little bit, you'd find out that the couple were fighting a lot. Mm -hmm. So you have to clear that. So sage might work if you believe sage works. And I will tell you something that Holly actually did for us when uh, I moved into my house. Um, the people who lived there were a little icky. Uh, in fact, they left the country. Um, he had, her husband had already left. They left the country as soon as she, the sale went through, and all of a sudden, like a week later, the sheriff is knocking at the door looking for them. Uh, debt collectors are looking for them. Oh, no. they, they went to Thailand. <laughs> so oh. they skipped the country with their money, which is, you know, didn't affect us at all. But because of that, the house felt a little icky. So Holly, at our housewarming party, had um, all my friends just walking around, cleaned their hands first, walked around, touching the walls, thinking of their happiest memories and just moving through the whole house. And you know, the house felt phenomenal, felt great. No burning sage, it just, we got rid of the, the impact uh, yeah. of their emotions just by putting better emotions into the place. Yeah. That's really all you need to do. Would you call that placebo? It's, it, it's not really, I mean, it's a placebo if it makes me feel better. Everybody felt this. Mm -hmm. This was, this did have an actual impact because the intention. Mm -hmm. So it's actually mm -hmm. this mind over matter thing. Mm -hmm. um, our intentions, affect the physical environment. If you just burn sage to burn sage, you might feel better, but the environment might not change. Mm -hmm. If you burn sage and your intention is, as I'm moving through this house, the, the smoke of the sage is gonna clear things out, that'll have an impact. I see. It's always the intention. The action's always there. Totally always there. Always there, but we have to change the right. intention. Yeah, so if you're not Catholic and you're going to bring a Catholic priest in and he throws holy water around, he's just doing it for a donation. Oh. <laughs> Doesn't affect your belief at all, so. Yeah. So earlier I asked, what, what is the book that you would highly recommend? Well, you know, it really depends on people's interests. If people mm -hmm. want to try 
various aspects of mind over matter, mind over matter, including energy work, and doing things like moving objects. Yes. This is definitely the book. For yeah. That. Mind over matter. Yeah, and yeah. Um, there's a whole section in there on how to how to create uh, a situation in which mm -hmm. you can actually show yourself you can move objects. An exercise that uh, one of my late colleagues, kind of a mentor for me, actually came up with. But if you're interested in, in information and you want to learn about your dreams and whether they provide you with information about the future, then this is the book for that. So, okay. Yeah. So we are going to take a little break. Okay. Leaving hot coals improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey guys, it's Smokey! It looks as if Smokey is going to use the drown, stir, drown, and feel technique. After the first drown, a good stir. Next, another drink. Next and finally, a close feel. Is it cool? cool? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smokey, catch! Oh, my bad, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. And Lloyd, one of the things that I've been really looking forward to is, is talking about um, this, this amazing thing that you do as a mentalist. And um, can you pronounce that for me? Mentalist. A mentalist. Or psychic entertainer. And a psychic another, entertainer. Yeah, that's okay. Word. I'd love for you to give us an example. Sure, of, yeah? sure. Uh, you yeah. know, um, mentalism is a, is a fun thing mm -hmm. for me. Uh, I do, I perform as Professor Paranormal because it's a kind of ah. a humorous show that I do. <laughs> good, um, good. <laughs> and I hope to have a show coming up sometime in March. In mm -hmm. fact, uh, there's an Irish medium by the name of Sandra O'Hara, who is now in town, and she and I have done shows together, or bits together, where I have done my fantasy stuff, which is the non-real, and then she's mm -hmm. done the real thing. So uh, we're going to do a little something with cards. You know, uh, as a parapsychologist, people always expect me to work with ESP cards. Mm -hmm. The problem with ESP cards is there's only five symbols. And that only leaves you a one in five chance, but there's a one in 52 chance here. But one of the things people don't know is that being psychic is not just about me, it's about you. So if we have a telepathic experience, it's not just about me picking up on what's in your mind, it's you projecting what's in your mind. People can easily block that, actually. Mm -hmm. But what we're gonna do is something a little different. I'm okay. going to try to send you something. Ah, oh, okay. All right, so I also don't wanna show the camera this. I mean Okay. All right, so I've got a card in mind from here. I'm gonna mix these up a little bit. Now I'm gonna to try to send this to your unconscious. The thing about this, uh, about ESP, is that it typically works on an unconscious level. Mm -hmm. So I, what I'd like you to do is take the cards for a moment. Okay. All right, now, when I tell you to start, you can do this. I'm sending this card to your mind. Go through the faces of the cards. When you find one that's a little different, just feels odd or off, pull it out, put it face down on the table. Do okay. not put it face up, I'll just say that's it. Okay. All right, so let's see, put it face down. Okay. So go ahead. Okay. And it should just jump out at you or just feel a little different. Okay. Put it face down on the table, great. Okay. Um, I'm, take the rest of the cards, thank you. So the card, I, I tried to play a little little trick on you there, and I sent you the Joker. <laughs> I don't know if that's what you got. Most people will get the suit, but people rarely ever, you know, it happens once in a while. Oh, you got it, okay, great. So let's, let's do- Let me see that. <laughs> they all look the same. Well, yeah, I mean, they're marked on this side, <laughs> so you know what they are. So let's try yeah. something a little, one more time here. Ta you take these, okay. I'll take these. All right, I'd like you to, Find a card you like. Okay. Put it face down on the table. Okay, here we go. All right, great. Put your cards on top. Okay, now, um, not that I can really turn around here, but I'm gonna try to turn around as best I can. I'm gonna drag my cards off the table so that your card is somewhere buried in the middle. All right, take my cards, I'll take yours. Okay. Now, first, focus on the card that you selected, you're thinking of, the one you put down on the table. Okay. All right, focus on that, send that to me. I'm gonna send you my card. Okay, now you find my card, I'm gonna find yours. Same as before. Okay. I 
think that's yours. Put, put it down on the table. Great. Oh, which I don't want to bury, cover your card. So the card you were thinking of that you sent to me was what? Which the one? Queen we of Hearts. Queen of Hearts. Now what's really interesting to me <laughs> is that I also thought of a queen. I thought the Queen of Clubs. Did you get it? She got it. How about that? <laughs> uh, was that a trick too? <laughs> was that a trick? What do you think? <laughs> You're trying to make me feel special? Of course. You are special. <laughs> oh, that was really great. I don't see how they all... Look. I don't see any marks on no, the cards. No, there's no marks on the cards. Here, if you just go ahead and pull out a card, any one you want, just slide it out. Don't, don't pick it up yet. Just slide okay. it out. Slide it out? Yep. Any one. Not that one. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You can take that one if you want. Just slide it out. Of course, I take the middle. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Pick up the card and look at it. Okay. All right. Now hide it so the camera doesn't see it. Oh shoot! Did yeah. you see it? No. I, I mean, I, there wasn't. But now oh, I, just, I just saw it. So let's try that again. I don't think the camera can see the card. You're okay. Just slide one out. Okay. All right. Just slide it out. Put it on okay. the table. Great. All right. Now um, I'd like you to go ahead and pick it up. Take a look okay. at it. All right, and then either put it back down on the table or, or do it like that, hold it against yourself. I, okay. don't, I don't want to hold it against okay. you, so you hold it against yourself. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to say the colors very rapidly, all right? Okay. I'm going to try to read your reactions. Try to keep your best poker face on, all right, or giggle all you want. Either way, all right, I'm going to try to read your reactions for this. So I'm going to go through the colors first, and then I'm going to ask you a question. When I ask you the question, you may lie or tell the truth. Okay. Okay? Black, white, not white. See, I'm just trying to gauge your reactions here. Red, black, red, black, red, black, red, black, black, red, black, red, black, red, black, red. Okay, you may lie or tell the truth. Is it a black card? No. That is true. Most people lie on the first time. That's pretty good. All right, so I'm going to go through the suits now, assuming it's a red card. <laughs> Diamonds and hearts. Just look me in the eye. Look me in the eye. <laughs> As best you can. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> diamonds, hearts, diamonds, hearts, hearts, diamonds, diamonds, hearts, hearts, diamonds, diamonds, hearts, hearts, diamonds, hearts, diamonds, hearts. Liar, tell the truth. Is it a diamond? No. That is a lie. <laughs> I didn't do I paused. Now, of course, if I'm wrong Shoot. on either one of those, I'm going down the wrong path. I'm going to run through the, the cards themselves, so okay. very quickly. Ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, five, six, seven, eight. Is this the seven of diamonds? <laughs> Shoot. Is it the seven of diamonds? Show the camera. I was trying to lie with my eyes. Yes, you were. <laughs> Yes. That's really, that's pretty m remarkable. Don't play poker with me. No. <laughs> yeah. Do you win? I don't play poker. Why no, not? Nobody wants to play poker with me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, Have you tried? Uh, a couple times, yeah. And you would win. Yeah. You know, actually, it, it's real. <laughs> what's interesting is that that's so what I'm doing psychologically is kind of a binary. So think about this for a second. I'm asking mm -hmm. for one or the other. When you're bluffing, yes, it is. Are they bluffing or are they not bluffing? But it's not like I can say to you, are you bluffing or not bluffing? Are you bluffing or not bluffing? That would be a little silly in a poker game, unless I'm playing with some very silly people. So if I'm playing for shots, we could do it, but, but not for money. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That was amazing. So can you, can you mention any, do you, do you have any shows coming up? Um, I don't have any specific shows coming up. I mostly, honestly, I do um, private parties. Uh, corporate events, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, we will be doing something in March, I believe. Uh, just still trying to work out the venue at this point, so I don't have anything absolute to say for myself and Sandra O'Hara. And it'll probably be in, I'd say, probably mid to late March, or very. Actually, I think it'll be in early March if we can. Okay, do, do and right. a website. 
so best place right now, my website's under reconstruction. Mm -hmm. So people can either follow me on Twitter, which is at Prof Paranormal. Prof is in professor. Prof Paranormal. They can send me an email, get on my list. It's profparanormal at gmail.com. You can find me on Facebook. Just remember that Lloyd is spelled with one L when you're looking for me. Okay. Otherwise, I'm the only Lloyd Hour back out there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, I have a YouTube channel, which you can find by throwing my name in there as well. Okay. But either Twitter or Facebook or um, actually Twitter and uh, my email are the best ways to get a hold of me and find out. Great. Great. Thank you so much. I really You're enjoyed very welcome. that. I've, this is what I've primarily what I wanted to do. <laughs> Thank you yeah. so much.